Assalamualaikum and hello everyone. Welcome back for part 3. In this video, we are going to look at the general approach to chest x-ray pertaining to the cases involving dyspnea. These are the sources that I use for reference. Let us begin. First, let us look at our normal chest x-ray. We can divide the component of x-ray into seven. Starting from the midline, we have the mediastinum, hilar region bilaterally and the heart. Moving outwards, we have the lung fields, the pleura, the diaphragm, and bones. All of them are equally important, but we are going to focus a lot more on the abnormalities in the lung fields and the pleura. Along the way, we will look into the changes involving other components when necessary. In chest x-ray, the abnormality seen can either be increased in opacity of a normal structure or increase in lucency, more white or more black, respectively. Some authors classify the findings in X-ray based on the pattern of opacity. Some classify them according to the type of lesion seen. And at times, you will find some sources that mix both of them together. What I meant by pattern is for example, rounded or spherical shape opacity. The radiological term or lesion associated with those patterns for example, are mass-like lesion or nodular lesion. Personally, I find it easier to classify them based on pattern first and then radiological lesions. There are generally six patterns of opacity associated with the lung field. The first one is air space opacification. The best description, I think personally, is according to William and Herring. It is described as cloud-like and fluffy opacity. This pattern is also generally called consolidation. Consolidation is synonymous with pneumonia. It is the accumulation of exudates in the air space. In radiology, however, According to Fleischner Society, glossary of terms for thoracic imaging, the use of this term includes not only exudates but any products either fluids or solid that replaces the alveolar air, making them more quote-unquote solid. Some authors, however, reserve the definition of consolidation only for exudates. In that case, they prefer to use a more general term, that is airspace or pacification, to avoid confusion. We will look into that later. The second pattern is around or spherical shape opacity. Spherical is used only if both frontal and lateral film are obtained. Depending on its size, it is described as either mass-like lesion or nodular lesion. Third is reticular or net-like opacity. Example of fine reticular opacity is interstitial edema. Coarse reticular opacity is usually associated with pulmonary fibrosis. Opacity can be linear, such as in subsegmental atelectasis or curly lines. Triangular shape opacity is associated with lobar atelectasis. Example of hemithorax opacity is total lung atelectasis or massive unilateral pleural effusion. A compilation of all lung fields opacities in one chest x ray may look something like this. I edited the picture of the original image using Autodesk. So this is not an accurate representation of all the lesion. It may be exaggerated or underrepresented. But we will look at the examples of actual chest film with disease separately later accordingly when available. And I have to say that all the images that I use in this video are labeled for reuse and modification from Wikimedia Commons. Images that fall under such a label are very limited. So much thanks and gratitude goes to the owner of these images. All right, let's continue. Lung field lucency can be spherical in shape as well. Examples are cavitation and cystic lesion. The next category of lucency involves visibility of vascular markings either reduced or absent such as lung hyperinflation and pulmonary embolism respectively. Again, here are the examples of lesion created using Autodesk. For pleural lesion, examples of opacity seen is one that blunt the constophrenic angle such as in pleural effusion or pleural fibrosis. Spherical opacity with broad base may suggest tumour which are pleural in origin. For lucency, similarly we have lucency due to absent vascular markings such as pneumothorax or spherical lucency that may suggest loculated pneumothorax.
Alright, now let us look at the first pattern, which is S-based opacification or consolidation. I'm referring to consolidation as defined by Fleischner Society. The causes of A-space opacification depends on the alveolar content, either transudates, exudates, cell or aspirates. Example of transudate is pulmonary edema. For exudates, pus collection in A-space such as in pneumonia or blood such as in traumatic lung contusion or pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome. Example of cell field alveolar space is bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Fluid aspiration such as near drowning or gastric acid. Appearance of this cloud-like opacity can manifest differently. Heterogeneous, patchy and ill-defined is seen in bronchopneumonia. It can also be homogeneous and well-defined by the lung features such as in loba pneumonia or pulmonary infarction. Or with bat wing pattern where the consolidation is seen more in the center and it radiates to the lung periphery such as in pulmonary edema or pneumonia caused by pneumocystis carinae. Or the opposite pattern, which is known as reverse bat wing pattern. Here, the cloud-like opacity is seen more in the periphery, but much lesser at the central region. This is seen in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and eosinophilic pneumonia. If it is extensive, it can involve the whole lung, either diffuse unilaterally or bilaterally. So, space opacification or consolidation do not necessarily mean pneumonia. Now, I hope you can appreciate why some authors refrain from calling this type of opacification as consolidation. It is usually referred exclusively to pneumonia. In the previous video, we have covered pneumonia and pulmonary edema. So, let's focus on these two for a moment. Airspace opacification in bronchopneumonia and loba pneumonia are different. As I've mentioned earlier, the first one is ill-defined whereas loba pneumonia is more well-defined by the lung fissures. Since the opacification in bronchopneumonia are patchy, air bronchogram is not usually seen here. In comparison to loba, where the whole lobe is opaque, air bronchogram is seen more easily. Bronchopneumonia usually involves a part of many lobes at once, so it is multiloba but patchy, whereas in loba pneumonia it is rather confined to a particular lobe. Bronchopneumonia is relatively more common. Loba pneumonia is associated with infection by Streptococcus or Klebsiella. There are three other distinguishing features that may suggest a particular group of causative organism. In terms of location, pneumonia tends to involve the lower lobes, but some organisms have upper lobe predilection such as Klebsiella and those associated with aspiration pneumonia. Other differential of upper lobe consolidation includes post-primary tuberculosis and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Cavitation within consolidation is associated with Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Legionella, Aspergillus, and post-primary tuberculosis. The third one is loba engorgement, which is seen in pneumonia caused by Klebsiella and Haemophilus influenzae. To understand how loba engorgement is seen on X-ray, we have to understand the anatomy of each lobe in the chest X-ray. We will look into that when we discuss atelectasis later. There are, however, pneumonia which do not present with airspace opacification. Rather, it mimics other types of lung opacity such as reticular, spherical, or multinodular opacity. Thus, not all pneumonia cause airspace opacification. Pneumonia which present with reticular opacity is also called interstitial pneumonia. This is not to be confused with idiopathic group of interstitial pneumonia from interstitial lung disease such as acute interstitial pneumonia, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, or usual interstitial pneumonia. Those belong to a totally different group of pneumonias even though it sounds the same. I have generally introduced this group in a previous video. Known cause of pneumonia which presents with reticular opacity are due to atypical pathogens such as viruses, mycoplasma, chlamydia, or pneumocystis carinae. Pneumonia that resemble mass-like lesion on chest X-ray is also called round pneumonia. This is seen in Streptococcus and Haemophilus influenzae. Multinodal opacity is seen in pneumonia caused by varicella. Now let us look at some examples. This image shows loba pneumonia. According to the author, culture from nasopharynx from this patient is positive for Moraxella cataralis. He commented, however, that this is probably not the pathogen of the lung. Moraxella usually causes bronchopneumonia. 
only two organisms are associated with loba, which are Streptococcus and Klebsiella. This picture is a case of bronchopneumonia in an 88-year-old male presented with fever, fatigue, and mild coughing. Lab test was positive for Haemophilus influenzae. As we can see, the cloud-like opacities here involve multiple lobes and patchy. Next one is pulmonary edema. In cardiogenic pulmonary edema, increase in hydrostatic pressure cause fluid to transudate out of the alveolar capillaries and into the interstitium in the earlier stage. Then, this fluid can leak into the alveolar airspace and fill them up later. During the earlier stage, since the transudates are only confined to the interstitium, the chest X-ray will show fine reticular opacity instead rather than airspace opacification. It is accompanied by indistinct or hazy appearance of the outline of normal vascular markings which is also called perihilar haziness, with peribronchial cuffings and thickened septa seen as curly lines. Linear opacity in the central region is known as curly A lines, whereas peripherally at the lung bases it is known as curly B. In a later stage, when the fluid enters the alveolar space, only then we will see airspace opacification. It will show up centrally and radiates peripherally. This is when we will see the bat wing or butterfly pattern. Features supportive of cardiac cause of pulmonary edema includes cardiomegaly, upper lobe diversion or also known as cephalization and concurrent pleural effusion. Non-cardiogenic edema causes filling of the airspace with fluid via different means, either by direct filling of alveolar, such as in the case of near drowning, or indirectly by causing negative interstitial pressure, such as in high altitude or rapid lung re-expansion, post pneumothorax or pleural effusion, or by causing increased capillary permeability, such as in acute respiratory distress syndrome or toxic gas inhalation. Alright, next is spherical or round shape opacity. It is also called mass like lesion if the diameter is more than 3 cm or nodular lesion if 3 cm or lesser. The distinction between the two may help us to prioritize our differential, but there are many other factors to consider as well apart from the size. Spherical opacity can be solitary or multiple. For solitary opacity, we can divide them into benign and malignant. Generally, in terms of size, benign lesions are relatively smaller than malignant. For lesions less than 2 cm, 80% of them are benign. And for lesions more than 5 cm, 95% of them are malignant. So generally, we can say that nodular lesion is usually benign, whereas mass lesion suggests malignancy. But these categorizations, however, are not absolute. It is also found that 40% of malignant nodules are less than 2 cm, and 15% of malignant nodules are less than 1 cm. Just in case you are confused, for the first statement just now, we are talking about the percentage of benign and malignancy based on a particular cutoff point, which is 5 cm. That means for obesity with diameter more than 5 cm, 95% of them are malignant, while 5% are benign. But for the second and third statement, we are talking about the percentage of different size within the malignant group alone. That means if 40% are less than 2 cm, the other 60% are 2 cm or larger. And if 15% of malignant lesion are less than 1 cm, that means the other 85% are 1 cm or larger. They are three distinct comparisons. That's why the three of them do not add up to 100%. The second factor is the shape or border. Benign lesion is associated with smooth and well-defined spherical shape, whereas malignant is the opposite. Three examples of malignant features are lobulated appearance, notch, or speculated. But about a fifth of smooth, well-defined lesions are malignant, so we cannot rule out malignancy. Likewise, about a quarter of not-so-well-defined lesions are actually benign. Third is calcification. Generally, calcification is associated with benign lesion, but it is also seen in malignancy. Calcification in benign lesion tend to be uniform, central or laminated, or popcorn type calcification, which is photognomonic for benign hamatoma. Malignancy is not usually associated with calcification, but if it does, it tends to be eccentric or irregular. The fourth one is cavitation. 
It is usually associated with malignancy and tend to have thick wall. Thin wall usually suggests benign lesion. And for the fifth one, I compile five features together because all of these features are pointing towards malignancy. You can remember them as ache. Age, chest wall involvement, hyalur lesions, effusion, and doubling time. Elderly is associated with malignancy. There is 50% risk of a cancer in those aged more than 50 years old. Chest wall involvement can either be lytic or sclerotic, but sclerotic lesions are rarely a product of lung cancer metastasis. It may suggest secondary metastasis from other soft tissue tumors. Hyalur lesion due to lymphadenopathy. Plural metastasis can cause plural effusion. Doubling time is the time taken for the opacity to become double in volume on follow-up. Those which double within 20 to 400 days are suggestive of malignancy. Lesser or more than that suggests benign disorder. The final step before we look into the differential is to identify the likely origin of the lesion, either from the lung parenchyma or pleura by looking at both frontal and lateral view. We can divide them into those which has no or narrow base, meaning they do not attach to or just minimally in contact with coastal pleura, mediastinal pleura, or diaphragmatic pleural surface. The second group is those with broad base, meaning they are largely in contact with the pleural surface. So the lesion does not necessarily has to be in the periphery for us to say that there is possibility of pleural origin because we also have mediastinal pleura, so pleural lesion can also be centrally located. Let's look at the differentials. If the opacity is solitary and has no or narrow base, according to the characteristics above, it can either be benign or malignant. Benign disorder can be tumor or non-tumor. Examples of benign lung tumor are hamartoma, which is associated with popcorn calcification, and hemangioma, predominantly located at the lower lung lobe because this is the area with highest perfusion. Example of benign non-tumor lesion is tuberculoma, usually with uniform or central calcification. Aspergilloma or mycetoma usually colonize pre-existing old cavities, so it can be seen as a spherical opacity within a cavitation. Rheumatoid lung nodule has a wax and wane pattern. It disappears with treatment and recur. Opacity seen in veganous granulomatosis is associated with cavitation in 50% of cases. And lastly, round pneumonia, which we have discussed earlier, usually caused by streptococcus and haemophilus. They are not associated with cavitation or calcification. If it has malignant features, it may suggest primary lung cancer such as carcinomas or carcinoid tumor, or secondary tumors which spread hematogenously. It is also called miliary metastasis. As we have discussed in previous video, adenocarcinoma, which is the most common carcinoma, tends to be solitary because it is slow-growing compared to the rest of carcinoma and located in the lung periphery. Squamous present as central mass since it involves major airway complications such as obstructive lung atelectasis is also seen. It is also the most common type among all the carcinoma to cause cavitation. Small cell is also centrally located since it is the most aggressive tumor, only 5% are solitary, most present with multiple lesions. Large cell is commonly at the periphery. Majority of carcinoid tumor is also centrally located. For secondary lung metastasis, most of them present with multiple spherical lesions, but around 10% can present with a solitary mass. Here is an example of a solitary lesion. Unfortunately, there is not much description about the patient history, only that he was diagnosed with lung cancer. The round shape opacity here is quite big, definitely more than 3 cm in diameter. No cavitation or calcification seen, quite well defined round shape rather than lobulated. The size perhaps is very significant here to suggest malignancy. Because as we have learned just now, 90% of mass more than 5 cm are malignant. And we also need to take into account that a fifth of well-defined spherical mass can also be malignant. If the opacity is broad based, we should consider plural disorders as well. But we shouldn't neglect the possibility of diagnosis associated with narrow base lesion because it does not rule out disease of parenchymal in origin. Here, benign pleural tumors can be tumor or non-tumor as well. 
Example of benign pleural tumors are lipoma, which is the most common, and pleural fibroma. This tumor can be pedunculated. In that case, we can see tailing sign. Pleural fibroma can be huge even more than 7 cm all the way to spinine. 20% of fibrous tumors are malignant. Example of benign non-tumor disorder is loculated pleural effusion. The effusion can be loculated due to localized pleural thickening and fibrosis. Likewise, malignancy can be primary in pleural tumor or secondary metastasis. Example of primary malignant tumors are mesothelioma, fibrosarcoma, and liposarcoma. Mesothelioma may present with massive pleural effusion alone without obvious spherical opacity because it is obscured by the effusion. It is linked to chronic exposure to asbestos. In that case, we may see pleural plaque or calcification which are suggestive of asbestosis. Fibrosarcoma, on the other hand, are not associated with exposure to asbestos. It can be pedunculated as well, with or without calcification and effusion. Most common source of pleural metastasis is lung carcinoma. Other common source are breast and lymphoma. Pleural effusion actually is the commonest presentation. Unfortunately, I don't have an example for you here that is labeled for reuse, but a broad-based lesion should look something like this. You can google mesothelioma of pleural fibroma for example of broad-based spherical opacity. Now let us look at multiple lesion. Common cause of multiple lesion falls under two major groups of disease, either tumor or interstitial lung disease. Generally, the tumors here are malignant, so they are characterized by multiple mass lesion or mix of both nodular and mass-like lesion. Interstitial lung disease are characterized by nodular lesions that are typically less than 3 mm, so sometimes it is also called micro-nodular lesion, with or without reticular opacity. Examples of tumors present with multiple spherical opacities are hematogenous or miliary metastasis. The opacities are commonly described as cannonball appearance. Kaposi sarcoma is associated with irregular flame-shaped peribronchovascular nodules. In osteosarcoma, the opacities are characteristically more dense or opaque than usual. Features of small cell carcinoma is as described previously. They are, however, non-tumor diseases that mimic metastasis, showing mix of multiple mass and nodular lesion, such as Wagner's granulomatosis and amyloidosis. Interstitial lung disease with micronodular lesions can be categorized into idiopathic, occupational, or smoking-related disease. Examples are sarcoidosis, cold workers' pneumoconiosis, silicosis, Lagerhans cell histiocytosis, or also known as eosinophilic granulomas, and desquamative interstitial pneumonia. Rheumatoid granulomas, however, can present with relatively larger nodular lesions, more than 3 mm but less than 3 cm. As described previously, the nodules wax and wane with treatment. Non-interstitial lung disease that can mimic the appearance of micronodular lesions, for example, are tuberculosis, commonly described as showing millet seed appearance. The nodules in histoplasmosis and varicella pneumonia often leak calcified. Lastly is lymphangitis carcinomatosa, or basically metastasis that spread via lymphatic vessels. So remember that hematogenous and lymphatic metastasis present differently on X-ray. We will look at the examples of tumor that spreads via lymphatic vessels after this. Another helpful feature to prioritize your differentials is hyalur lesions. Diseases from both groups associated with hyalur lesions are malignancy, fungal infection, miliary tuberculosis, and sarcoidosis. This is an example of film showing multiple round shaped opacities. The size of each lesion here varies, some are presumably less than 3 cm and some are perhaps larger than that, but this is definitely not micronodular. So we may want to think of lung malignancy and its differentials in this case. Next is reticular opacity. It has net-like pattern which at times proves difficult to be differentiated from normal lung vascular marking, especially if it is fine reticular opacity. Vascular marking is normal whereas reticular opacity is pathological. Among the key features to differentiate them are first, vascular marking branch in an orderly manner. From the hyalur region, it spreads outwardly to the lung periphery. 
Secondly, there is tapering, meaning the diameter of the vessels should become narrower at the periphery. And lastly, there shouldn't be any visible vessels in the outer 2cm long field. These are useful guides to remember. So if the opacity is non-branching or it branched in a disorderly manner, non-tapering or visible at the outer 2cm long field, it may suggest reticular opacities rather than vascular markings. It can be fine or coarse looking. Fine reticular opacity is due to edematous interstitium. It appears as thin reticular lines less than 3 mm in size with preserved parenchymal structure, meaning the lung field otherwise look normal without cystic or cavitating lesion. Coarse reticular opacity, on the other hand, is due to fibrotic interstitium. It appears as thick reticular lines with distorted parenchymal structure, thus cystic lesion is commonly seen. Here are the examples of fine versus coarse reticular opacity. The picture on your left is a case of pulmonary edema in its early stage, so fine reticular pattern is seen here rather than airspace opacification. The small four arrows are showing curly B lines at the lung periphery. We know that there shouldn't be any vessels at the outer 2 cm of the lung field, hence this is abnormal. Presence of cardiomegaly suggests that this may be a case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The picture on your right is a case of drug-induced pulmonary fibrosis. Here, the net-like pattern are comparably much thicker. You can also appreciate that from the center, the opacity becomes lesser in intensity as it extends to the lung periphery. However, at the very end of the lung periphery, it becomes opaque again, which is abnormal. There are also multiple ill-defined, almost round-shaped lucencies or dark areas that are connected together in the lung field. This may suggest developing small cystic spaces due to parenchymal distortion due to fibrosis. The reticular patterns are generalized in both fields, but is slightly more at the mid and lower zones, so we can include the causes of pulmonary fibrosis with lower lobe predilection as our differentials. Causes of fine reticular opacity are pulmonary edema and interstitial pneumonia. We have discussed this earlier in this video. In pulmonary edema, the approach would be to differentiate cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic cause. For interstitial pneumonia, the organisms are usually atypical such as viruses, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and pneumocystis carinae. For cause reticular opacity, we can classify the causes into those with upper lobe predilection and those with lower lobe predilection. We have also discussed this in previous video. You can use this mnemonic to help you remember. All of these are interstitial lung disease. They are, however, other diseases that can show this pattern such as lymphangitis carcinomatosa or simply malignant tumors which spread through the lymphatics. Common secondary tumors that cause this appearance when it metastasizes to the lung are GIT tumors such as colon, stomach, and pancreatic cancer. These are different from those that cause hematogenous metastasis. However, breast and lung carcinoma can cause both. Alright, next is linear, triangular, and hemithorax opacity. Let's discuss them together because all of these changes are found in a common disorder that is atelectasis or lung collapse. In the first video, we learned that atelectasis can be divided into three types, resorption or obstructive atelectasis, compression atelectasis, and contraction atelectasis. A brief revision, resorption is caused by obstruction by mucus, plug, or any mass, Compression atelectasis is due to any content in the pleura, such as pleural effusion or pneumothorax. Contraction atelectasis is due to pulmonary fibrosis. Linear, triangular, and hemithorax opacities are actually seen in the first group. For the second and third group, we simply look for changes that suggest the cause of atelectasis. For example, for pleural effusion, we simply look for opacity that blunt the costophrenic angle. There are no extra findings for compression atelectasis because the blunted angle itself already suggests something is filling the pleura and elevates or compresses the lung parenchyma upwards. Same can be said about pneumothorax. We can further divide the changes in resorptive atelectasis according to the part of the lung involved, either subsegmental, lobar, or total lung collapse. 
Subsegmental collapse is seen as linear opacity parallel to the diaphragm. It is a common post-operative complication, especially with general anesthesia. Since mechanical ventilation is used for respiration, the diaphragm do not contract as frequent, hence it remains to be dome-shaped rather than flattened when patient is under. The part of the lung that is in contact with the diaphragm are compressed for some time, and after patient resume natural breathing post-operation, the segments that are collapsed do not immediately re-expand with air, hence it will be seen as these linear lines parallel to the diaphragmatic surface. Differentials include localized fibrosis and pneumonia. However, subsegmental collapse will re-expand again spontaneously after a few days to differentiate this from pneumonia. Loba collapse is seen as triangular opacity with its apex pointing towards the hilum. To differentiate this with loba consolidation, loba collapse may be associated with pooling signs, for example tracheal deviation or ray semidiaphragm at the same site. Air bronchogram shouldn't be seen in loba collapse, however, it can present in loba pneumonia. We will look into each loba collapse in a second. Total lung collapse is seen as homogeneous hemithorax opacity simply because there is no air in the lung and pooling signs on the same side. Differentials for homogeneous hemithorax opacity are massive pleural effusion, pneumonectomy, and diffuse pneumonia. Alright, back to loba collapse. Triangular opacity differs according to the loop involved. We have 5 loops in total. In order to make sense of the findings, let us quickly revise the anatomy of each loop in chest x-ray. There are 3 different colors here representing the different loops. But before we look into that, let us focus on the white linear line first. There are 3 of them, 2 on the right lung and 1 on the left. These lines are not visible in normal x-ray. To make this line, we simply need to locate the hilum which is where the vascular markings originated, and the fifth or fourth anterior rib somewhere in that ridge, and draw a straight horizontal imaginary line between these two points, that should make the horizontal fissure or also known as minor fissure. From the same point at the periphery, just roughly make another curved line that crosses to the base of the lung at the most medial side of each lung field. This should make the oblique fissure or also known as the major fissure. And that is how you delineate the green line for right middle lobe and the red line for right and left upper lobes. The horizontal fissure should be the base for the right upper lobe, but for the left upper lobe, its base is formed by the oblique fissure. For lower lobes, our reference point is the aortic knuckle superiorly and the inferior most loosened point around the costophrenic angle. They mark the highest and lowest point for lower lobes respectively. And that is how you get the blue lines for lower lobes. From the frontal view, we can see that some areas are actually obscured by normal structure. For example, part of the lower lobes are obscured by the diaphragm and the heart. Another commonly missed lesion are at the lung apices for upper lobe. Hence, lateral view film will be helpful to locate this lesion. Similarly, we have to draw the fissures first. The reference points are similar. To draw the oblique fissure, draw a straight line starting from the anterior inferior most loosened point in the lung field. Draw it across the center of the hilum where the vascular markings meet and its highest point at the end should be at the same level as the aortic knuckle. And that's it for the left lung. Anything above the line is upper lobe and anything below is the lower lobe. For the right lung, simply draw another horizontal line at the level of the hilum for your horizontal fissure. Alright, now that we have identified those, let us look at lobar collapse. First is right upper lobe collapse. Generally, the key points for any lobar collapse are three. Triangular opacity with its apex pointing towards the hilum, pooling signs and displacement of fissure. Location of opacity and fissure displacement specifically help us to identify the lobe involved. Here, we have a triangular opacity at the right upper zone with its apex pointing at the hilum. But pulling signs such as tracheal deviation and raised hemidiaphragm on the same side is not depicted in this illustration. Now we know that the minor or horizontal fissure is supposed to line between the hilum and somewhere around the 4th or 5th ribs. In this case, it is shifted upwards. The principle behind it is in a lobar collapse, the remaining lobe will be hyperinflated to fill the vacant space. 
That is why the fissure is displaced upward in this case because the remaining lobe on the right side becomes hyperinflated. So you really have to know the demarcation of normal fissure to understand this. In the horizontal view, since this is a right upper lobe collapse, we should draw two imaginary lines because the right lung has three lobes. Again, the triangular opacity is seen here. The horizontal fissure is displaced upward because the middle lobe expands to fill the vacant space. Since the oblique fissure is more vertical than horizontal, we describe the displacement of oblique fissure here as anterior shift. This is due to the expansion of the right lower lobe. Next is right middle lobe. Unlike other lobar collapse, identification of right middle lobe collapse from frontal chest film is a bit challenging because the triangular opacity here are usually ill-defined. This is because of two reasons. First, the right middle lobe is smaller compared to other lobe. And secondly, after collapse, the other lobes become hyperinflated, further increasing the size gap. Hyperinflation means more air, so the overlap between opacity and air lucency makes the triangular opacity here ill-defined. The best clue for right middle loop is actually loss of right cardiac border. From lateral view, however, the typical findings are more easily seen. The triangular opacity is seen pointing towards the hilum. Horizontal fissure is shifted downwards instead due to right upper loop expansion. And the oblique fissure is shifted anteriorly due to right lower loop expansion. For right lower loop collapse, similarly, triangular opacity is seen pointing towards the hilum. The medial side of the right hemidiaphragm will be obscured by the opacity. We may still be able to see the outline of the right heart border despite the overlapping opacity because the lower lobe is posterior to the heart while the middle lobe is anterior to it. From lateral view, the oblique fissure will be displaced posteriorly because the upper lobe expands. Sometimes it is a bit difficult to appreciate this triangular opacity. The picture here is edited of course to make it easier for us to understand the changes. It is a bit difficult because the upper lobe may inflate to the extent that it makes the whole thorax seems filled with air, not to mention that we are looking at the right and left lung at the same time in this plane. So the other useful sign to identify lower lobe collapse is spine sign. Normally, the outline of the vertebral column can be seen clearly because it is surrounded on the right and left by air in both lungs. The inferior portion of vertebral column especially is supposed to be more radiolucent compared to the upper portion of vertebral column because it is less surrounded by soft tissue. If the inferior portion of vertebral column and its surrounding appears more opaque, this is known as spine sign. Alright, next is left upper lobe. It is different compared to right upper lobe collapse because we only have two lobes in the left lung. So if the left upper lobe collapse, the remaining space will be filled by the left lower lobe. The triangular opacity here is also a bit difficult to be appreciated than others, similar to right middle lobe collapse. A helpful sign that suggests left upper lobe collapse is periaortic lucency, known as Lufsickle sign. The periaortic outline becomes visible here because the superior segment of lower lobe, when it is hyperinflated, it is interposed in between the aorta and the collapsed left upper loop. From lateral view, the oblique fissure is shifted anteriorly and the retrosternal area becomes opaque. The last one is left lower loop collapse. The findings are similar to right lower loop collapse. The medial left hemidriform will be obscured in frontal view. From lateral view, the oblique fissure will be shifted posteriorly and spine sign is also seen. Alright, now let's move on to spherical lucency. Spherical lucency may suggest either cystic lesion or cavitation. There are a lot of radiological terms for this, so make sure you check the Fleischner Society glossary of terms for thoracic imaging. Features that define cystic lesion are thin wall less than 2mm. It is usually air-filled but may contain fluid or solid. Cavitation, on the other hand, has a thick wall and located within consolidation mass or nodular lesion. It is also described as active cavitation if the margin is irregular and fluid filled with surrounding opacities. Or dormant or inactive if it is simply air filled with regular margin and no surrounding opacities. Inactive cavitation may be difficult to be distinguished from a cystic lesion. Cystic lesion is also described as blep 
if it is less than 1 cm in diameter and is contiguous with the pleura. Or bullae if it is more than 1 cm, but bullous lesion does not necessarily need to be contiguous with the pleura. The use of these two terms, black and bullae, are actually discouraged because the difference between the two do not necessarily have any clinical significance. It is perhaps better to describe them simply as cystic lesion. Honeycombing is another type of cystic lesion. It describes multiple cystic lesion that varies in diameter which are usually accompanied by coarse reticular opacity. This appearance signifies end-stage pulmonary fibrosis. Cystic lesion can be single or multiple. Differential for cystic lesions are pneumatocil, loculated pneumothorax, simple lung cyst, idiopathic giant emphysematous bullae, and pulmonary hydatid cyst. Pulmonary hydatid cyst is usually fluid filled, so air fluid level can be seen within the cystic lesion. Multiple cystic lesion without honeycombing pattern and coarse reticular opacity signifies bullous lung disease. Differentials include bullous emphysema, lymphangioleomatosis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, BHD syndrome, follicular bronchiolitis, and amyloidosis. Other than bullous emphysema, the other bullous lung diseases are actually quite rare. Multiple cystic lesion with surrounding reticular opacity suggests end stage fibrosis. Generally, the causes are roughly similar to those associated with coarse reticular opacity. Common ones include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, asbestosis, and connective tissue disease. Differentials other than interstitial lung disease is cystic form of bronchiectasis. For cavitation, we have roughly discussed its causes in other radiological lesions just now. Cavitation within consolidation may suggest infectious disease such as lung abscess, cavitating pneumonia, post-primary TB, and fungal infection. Cavitation within mass lesion may suggest malignancy. Other causes include granulomatous disease, pulmonary infarction, and bronchogenic cysts. Alright, the last one is lucency associated with changes in vascular markings, either reduced or absent. Three diseases associated with these changes are emphysema, pneumothorax, and pulmonary embolism. Features of emphysema is hyperinflation. You can identify hyperinflation by looking at the number of ribs visible above each hemidiaphragm. Normally, about 5 to 7 anterior ribs and 8 to 10 posterior ribs are seen. If 8 or more anterior ribs or 11 or more posterior ribs are seen, it suggests lung hyperinflation, which is a feature of emphysema. Since more air is trapped within the lung, the vascular markings will be less visible than normal. The lung field on both sides will appear generally loosened. The cardiac borders will appear as if it is stretched vertically. Other useful feature is flattening of the diaphragms on both sides so it will appear less dome-shaped. For pneumothorax, the features are visible visceral pleural line since air occupies the pleural space. Anything lateral to the pleural line will be devoid of vascular markings. In case of tension pneumothorax, we can also see pushing signs such as tracheal deviation to the opposite side. For pulmonary embolism, the features include regional oligemia, enlarged pulmonary artery with or without sign of pulmonary infarction such as wedge-shaped air opacification. On the left is a picture of normal chest x-ray. If let's say the embolus block the pulmonary artery supplying the lower lung zones, Anything distal to it will be devoid of blood, so a localized area of regional lucency without vascular markings will be seen. This is known as regional oligemia or western mark sign. Blood will accumulate proximal to the embolus, so we may see enlarged pulmonary artery. Wedge shape opacity is seen as consolidation like lesion resembling pneumonia, but in this case, the airspace is filled with necrotic cells. It is seen at the lung periphery when the embolus lodge more distally, blocking the blood supply to small lung segment. This is also known as Hampton Harm sign. Before we end, let's briefly look at differentials for hyalur lesion and common diseases that we have covered previously associated with this lesion. Hyalur opacities can be due to enlarged pulmonary vessels or mass due to bronchial tumor or lymphadenopathy. Common cause of unilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy are tuberculosis bronchial carcinoma and fungal infection. Commonest cause for bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy is sarcoidosis. Malignant lymphoma can cause both unilateral and bilateral lesion. 
Tuberculosis and fungal infection also can cause bilateral enlargement, but in rare occasion. If you notice, there are a lot of findings associated with tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. The commonest findings for sarcoidosis is actually bilateral hyla opestis. It presents in 90% of cases. Reticular nodular opacity is seen in 50% of cases and about 20% shows reticular opacity with honeycombing cystic lesion. Features of tuberculosis differs for primary and post-primary. Commonest feature of primary TB is actually unilateral mediastinal or hyalur lymphadenopathy. Consolidation is seen in 73% of cases involving the middle or lower lobes. Other features are calcified granuloma, atelectasis and unilateral pleural effusion. For post-primary, the commonest is cavitation within consolidation at the upper lung zone, either apical or posterior segment of upper lobe or superior segment of lower lobe. Pleural effusion is seen in 50% of cases, followed by lymphadenopathy in 10% and tubercloma in 5% of cases. Traction bronchiectasis is a non-chronic sequelae of tuberculosis. Alright, that is all for this video. Share them with a colleague and subscribe to this channel if you find this useful. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.